Hello and welcome everyone to another seminar in our REIT series. My name is Anna Manera and I'm a postdoc research fellow at Crawford. Although I am based in the traditional lands of the Noongar Wajak people in what is now the city of Perth in the southwest of Western Australia. We are here to attend the seminar delivered by Angela Mariam, who is a PhD student at Crawford, although she's currently based in Canada. Her seminar will be catalyzing more constructive social dialogue, a case study of energy transitions. Angela has a rich uh, background with over a decade in experiencing grassroots environmental activism, adult education and public policy research. Angela's research is currently addressing how to catalyze more constructive social dialogue to influence everyday politics. Angela's PhD explores a case study of transition to renewable energy. If you want to know more about Angela's bio and her current work, you can find more information on her profile in the Crawford page. So without further ado, I'm going to give the word to the word sorry to Angela. Thanks for delivering the seminar. Hello, my name is Angela Merriam and I will be presenting a paper that I'm calling uh, Social Dialogue, a Case Study of Clean Energy Transitions. So I'm a PhD candidate at the ANU Crawford School. Let's get into it. So the transition to clean energy is a really important public policy challenge, both in Canada, where I am right now, and in Australia, where I've been living for, for many years. I'm a citizen of both places. Social dialogue is recognized as a really critical part of the transition to clean energy by both academics and policymakers. But energy policy literature lacks a thorough understanding of the role of social dialogue in the context of energy transitions including why it matters and how it might be improved. In this paper, I look at the challenges and opportunities for catalyzing more constructive social dialogue on energy transitions. And I argue that this might be relevant at multiple levels of scale and possibly on other issues. Uh, I offer two specific ways that might be useful to sort of open the floodgates of social dialogue. Uh, I call these, cog these ideas cognitive receptivity and effective receptivity, drawing, uh, and I draw on psychology and deliberative democracy literature uh, to develop these ideas. So what is social dialogue? Meant to be the next slide. Yes, this is supposed to be the next slide. So what is the context? Uh, the context is energy as a socio-technical system. So energy systems are more complex than just pipes and wires that can be moved around at will by free thinking policy actors. Instead, the energy system is a socio-technical system, a cluster of elements including technology, regulations, user practices and markets, cultural meanings, infrastructure, maintenance networks and supply networks. Also, I would add to that collective and individual identities and ways of communicating are part of this socio-technical system. While the energy policy literature is clear about how to transition the physical infrastructure, the pipes and wires of the energy system, it's a lot less clear on how to understand and influence the socio-cultural infrastructure of the, inter of the energy system. So cultural meanings or identities. So this paper is part of uh, this effort to begin to understand, this effort in the literature that's been going on for a while around how to understand the social dimensions of the energy transition. There we go. So what is social dialogue? Uh, I think Anna alluded to this, that um, there is a debate uh, in democratic theory, and I'm sure there will be for a long time, around what type of speech merits scholarly attention. So here in this paper, I consider social dialogue as inclusive but not limited to everyday talk, as well as formal deliberations or community engagement. So 
This definition of social dialogue illuminates all levels of the multi-level perspective in energy transitions literature, which is a really key part of understanding how uh, transitions happen in society, how niche, how, how new innovations develop in a niche are adopted at a regime level when conditions at a landscape level allow for that. So, so I believe it's really important to understand that this really broad range of, of talk and, and possibly influence uh, the way we have democratic conversations. So why, a little bit more about why we're looking at social dialogue for energy transitions. What does literature have to say about this? So one reason to really take seriously this question of social dialogue for energy transitions is that publics are demanding it. Publics are demanding uh, more deliberation, participation on energy policy, in large part because of concerns about climate change. Social dialogue is also, also really useful for consolidating a sense of responsibility or accountability of the various players involved in energy policy, as well as reinforcing mutual understanding and trust. And this happens, of course, at all levels of the system, at an institutional level, as well as at the level of everyday talk. Social dialogue is also necessary if, fo if fossil fuel communities are to really become more valuable players in renewable energy planning, which uh, there are some strains in the literature that, that really encourage. Social dialogue is also inherent and assumed in a lot of conceptions of justice, in particular recognition and procedural justice. So of course, we must speak to each other in order to be recognized, in order to participate in democratic procedures. Social dialogue may also lay the foundations for the social license to operate, or in this case, so the social license to operate for renewable energy product, projects, and maybe a social license to, to stop operating if we're, discussing fossil fuels. That's not, a, that's not a sort of conceptual idea that I'm engaging with, but just thought it might be worth mentioning to sort of query this idea of, of social license to operate and what it means. So there are also a lot of reasons uh, to have structured social dialogue, and this is more where the literature focuses on. So I mentioned that some conceptions of, of justice include or require social dialogue, uh, distributional justice as well, in particular when we're, when we're considering unions as well as indigenous and traditional owners uh, participation. Moreover, uh, this is a quite a politically polarized issue and uh, we know that deliberation reduces polarization Structured social dialogue is also used quite frequently as a strategic technique just to engage people who will be asked to implement solutions, to get buy-in from, from institutions as well as other bodies who will be asked to uh, in, in sort of this way of encouraging reciprocity. So why is social dialogue challenging? We know that it's important. We know that uh, it really matters in this context. But why is it challenging here? I mean, maybe I don't need to even ask that question as I'm physically lo located. And I forgot my acknowledgement, excuse me, I'm located on the, the lands of the Anishinaabe people uh, just outside of Ottawa, uh, the capital of Canada. And uh, I'm sure some people would have read, uh, many of you would have read about the uh, protests that we've had for the past few weeks uh, around COVID-19 vaccine mandates uh, and looking at the way that this has divided societies here makes it almost seem like a silly question to say why is social dialogue challenging uh, but I'm trying to articulate a few reasons that it's pretty that it's especially a challenging in the context of energy transitions. 
So one reason is that this question of changing culture and identity is a really key psychosocial question in transitioning communities. Uh, some academics argue that transitioning communities may be experiencing uh, addiction, sort of a societal level addiction, or cognitive lock-in, which can limit the scope of transition planning, planning and block the transition to renewable energy. It can create a sort of inertia or, or attachment to what's uh, to the past. The way that scientists and activists communicate may also be counterproductive, may, may feed into this sort of um, cognitive lock-in leading to defensive denial in transitioning communities. So, and never, despite all of these challenges to social dialogue, we know that some fossil fuel-based economies are reshaping culture and their own senses of identity. So it is possible. Uh, we also know that historically, of course, there have been many, many uh, changes to eco economies, identities, etc., and that at, and that culture and identity is a fluid and moving and dynamic uh, construct. So the question is, how do we encourage this movement, or how how does how does this move? A social license to to stop operating if we're discussing fossil fuels. That's not a that's not a sort of conceptual idea that I'm engaging with, but just thought it might be worth mentioning to sort of query this idea of, of social license to operate and what it means. So there are also a lot of reasons uh, to have structured social dialogue. And this is more where the literature focuses on. So I mentioned that some conceptions of, of justice include or require social dialogue, uh, distributional justice as well, in particular when we're, when we're considering unions as well as indigenous and traditional owners uh, participation. Moreover, uh, this is a quite a politically polarized issue and uh, we know that deliberation reduces polarization. Structured social dialogue is also used quite frequently as a strategic technique just to engage people who will be asked to implement solutions, to get buy-in from, from institutions as well as other bodies who will be asked to uh, in, in sort of this way of encouraging reciprocity. So why is social dialogue challenging? We know that it's important. We know that uh, it really matters in this context. But why is it challenging here? I mean, maybe I don't need to even ask that question as I'm physically lo located. And I forgot my acknowledgement. Excuse me, I'm located on the, the lands of the Anishinaabe people uh, just outside of Ottawa, uh, the capital of Canada. And uh, I'm sure some people would have read, uh, many of you would have read about the uh, protests that we've had for the past few weeks uh, around COVID-19 vaccine mandates uh, and looking at the way that this has divided societies here makes it almost seem like a silly question to say why is social dialogue challenging uh, but I'm trying to articulate a few reasons that it's pretty that it's especially a challenging in the context of energy transitions. So one reason is that this question of changing culture and identity is a really key psychosocial question in transitioning communities. Uh, some academics argue that transitioning communities may be experiencing uh, addiction, sort of a societal level addiction, or cognitive lock-in, which can limit the scope of transition planning, planning and block the transition to renewable energy. It can create a sort of inertia or, or attachment to what's uh, to the past. The way that scientists and activists communicate may also be counterproductive, may, may feed into this sort of 
um, cognitive lock-in, leading to defensive denial in transitioning communities. So, and never, despite all of these challenges to social dialogue, we know that some fossil fuel-based economies are reshaping culture and their own senses of identity. So it is possible. Uh, we also know that historically, of course, there have been many, many uh, changes to eco economies, identities, etc., and that at, and that culture and identity is a fluid and moving and dynamic uh, construct. So the question is, how do we encourage this movement, or how how does how does this move? Here, yeah, we do have time for this video and. So, so people who are passionate about climate change and uh, I've seen this so much amongst activists that I've worked, worked with and amongst other and scientists. Uh, let's go back to here. that these are incredibly challenging conversations to have. Uh, there's, so, there's so much emotion and so much going on in transitioning communities that are dealing with not only all of the challenges of uncertainty that modernity brings, uh, the challenges of recognition, the challenges of identity that modernity brings. And Charles Taylor speaks about this uh, very well. But they're also dealing with this ad additional layer of uncertainty, unpredictability, uh, confusion around identity or even loss of identity. And uh, the contention that I'm making is that possibly through listening and consciously cultivating receptivity, we may open up the floodgates for more flow of social dialogue that goes both ways. And so the contention is to start with listening. Uh, democratic theory says that listening, receptivity, and reciprocity are a necessary yet very understudied element of public deliberation or social dialogue. Uh, it, this listening might even be the new democratic deficit or lack of listening. Uh, sometimes this kind of re reciprocity that's encouraged is framed as a receptive generosity because it, it is so generous to give someone the time and space to, to truly listen to them. A responsiveness to difference or a presumptive generosity. Modeling receptivity, we also know, encourages receptivity in others. Uh, Emily Beausoleil, whose work has, has really influenced me, also argues that receptivity is a pre precondition to agency. That paradoxically, while we might think that being receptive to another gives us less agency because we're more, I suppose, empty, the ability to, she says that the ability to create and act with clarity of vision and intention is connected to our capacity to open ourselves to the full context, internal complexity, and temporality of our impulses, desires, and subject positions. So while this might be a terrifying proposition, uh, as Carl Rogers liked to say, uh, it's also possibly a precondition to, to real agency. Some styles of communication are more likely than others to encourage the kind of safety and self-compassion necessary to catalyze this deep reflexive work of identity and culture shift. And this is often the domain where therapeutic styles of conversation tend to focus, which is why I'm drawing from psychology to, to talk to look for seeds or clues on how to, how we could catalyze more constructive dialogue on these, these complex issues. 
So one question is, could receptivity open the floodgates of social dialogue to encourage more flow and movement? So a lot of the democratic deliberative democracy literature seems to imply that it's, that it's enough to hold a desire or hold an intention or just to make the space for receptive listening. And we know that this, this is the case. We know from Carolyn Hendricks work, in fact, that, that receptivity and listening, even when it's done only strategically, has really important democratic um, benefits. So it does, it, so this, this is enough and receptivity is also a skill that can be learned and consciously cultivated and practiced. So what is receptivity? I'll explore here two types, uh, what I call cognitive receptivity and effective receptivity. So cognitive receptivity, this type of receptivity that we can consciously cultivate in order to allow social dialogue to flow more freely and to move is really about cognitively or verbally connecting with someone without agreeing. So aiming to, I like this phrase, connection before correction. Uh, it's also about signaling that the speaker has been heard. So one way of doing this, uh, one tool that's at the foundation of most therapeutic modalities stemming from humanistic psychology or especially the work of Carl Rogers uh, uses this all the time. So ACT therapy, motivational interviewing, uh, any kind of client-centered therapy. And all of these have a significant evidence base. Uh, so for the evidence base on non-directive reflective listening, uh, I've cited a couple randomized or a randomized control trial, as well as a meta-analysis that includes a lot of randomized control trials, which compares non-directive listening to, say, cognitive behavioral therapy or other kinds of modalities in order to test its effectiveness. Uh, I'm also arguing that, that non-directive reflective listening is suited for democratic encounters amongst equals. Uh, despite the fact that as far as I've seen, it hasn't been included or categorized or discussed in deliberative democracy literature. And, and I suggest that it's suitable for encounters amongst equals because, because of the fact that it's non-directive and it is meant to clarify and support the speaker to get in touch with their own voice perhaps you can say, with their own self, their own identity. And, uh, and, there's a, and there's a power and a movement that happens during that process that, I, that I'm referring to here. So Carl Rogers, uh, so one of the founders of humanistic psychology or very important psychologist says that when I have been low, do we have time now? Yeah, I think we have time now. If we want to do something a little interactive, because I find this stuff a lot more powerful when we can practice. It's so simple. So replying in the chat how you might reflect back to back yeah. what she's saying, how you might use non-directive reflective listening to respond to Beck. Yeah, should we do that? Yeah. So we'll be yeah. a reflective listeners in the chat and then you guys can do the role play. Okay, sounds good. Right. Well, uh, okay. Let's do that. So Beck, hey, nice to see you. Hi. Hey, oh, no, yeah, no, I some yeah. things. <laughs> well, I'm just really upset that we've had so many people coming into our community telling us what we should eat, the sort of car we should drive, how we should think, how we should dress, who we should vote for. And now they want to build wind turbines up in the hill next to us. And I just think it's too much. They can't leave us in peace. They keep coming and telling us what to do and how we should feel. And I'm just sick of it. I don't want any of it. I don't want turbines. I don't want solar panels. I just want the coal mines that I know that have supported me, that have sent my kids to school. I'm really sick of where things are at at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really hearing that you're, 
you're sick of where things are at right now with people coming in and telling you how to live your life and then wanting to build these renewable energy projects and it sounds it sounds like you just want to I think you said you just want peace is that right yeah thanks you know not many people say that and okay it's not so much about the turbines it's just that I don't like the way that things are happening and the way that other people are going about doing things to us in this community. Okay, so it's not specifically about the turbines, but it's more broadly about the way things are happening, you said, and the way that, is it that people are kind of telling you what to do or that kind they, of thing? They're not respecting us. I think that's what's really going on for me. So I keep smiling at all of these really cute messages saying, oh, Beck, it's like I'm having such a hard time. Should have talked about something that actually matters to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great one. It sounds like the process hasn't been very respectful. Is that right? No, that's right. It just feels like we're being steamrolled from people who think they know what's best for us, but they don't even talk to us. They don't listen. They don't ask. They don't know anything about what's going on in here. Okay, yeah, so, so you're finding that the people just aren't listening, they're not asking, they're just steamrolling through with, mm. with their projects, is that right? That is. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so this is an important moment, a great moment, just to, just to pinpoint and, and be attentive to, is that point at which the person goes, ah, I feel heard. <laughs> <laughs> Because the literature says, and certainly my experience says, that at that point, there be, it opens up this space for being willing to hear from the other person. So my being receptive to Beck created some receptivity in, in her. But I want, I want to hear from you, actually, first, Beck. Maybe that wasn't your experience. <laughs> no, I think so, because you got to the point where I felt like, oh, I don't need to keep saying anything because... I know that you've heard what I've said. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you, you really felt that I heard what you said. Hmm, yeah, thanks. I noticed your, your speech getting a bit more calm as well as we, <laughs> as it was reflected. <laughs> you started off a little bit more intense. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a really interesting thing to work through that example, even though it's a role play. I was playing a character, but to think about how it is that our conversations do play out and that we often um, escalate and amplify each other instead of taking the approach that you did in that example there. Yeah, yeah. And I often escalate as well. Part of the reason I enjoy writing about this is that it reminds me to reflectively listen. Um, <laughs> I am going to uh, I'm going to read out just a few of the comments that I especially like that are really uh, great examples of uh, reflective listening. So I, I read out Kat's comment I'll, as well. Anna says, Beck, that sounds very well, overwhelming. It sounds like it's hard to cope with everything at once. Is that right? Uh, um Nick same thing so yeah I'm really enjoying I'm really enjoying reading some of the the comments uh to answer your question Nick what comes next is effective rece receptivity so yeah actually for the sake of time I think I'll continue so non-directive is being led by what the speaker is saying and reflecting back to them what they're saying. Exactly. Non-directive is being led by what the speaker, non-directive re reflective listening is around the speaker leading the interaction and the listener just reflecting back to them what they're saying and checking in, making sure to check in. Uh, is that right? Have I, have I got it right? Because that gives them a chance to reframe what's going on for them to reframe it for themselves just as much as for you. So unless anyone else has any questions about that, I know we're going through this a little bit quickly, but uh, it is an academic presentation, so I don't want to, so I'm, I'm nervous about it being too applied. Um, I, I saw Nick's question about once 
that person has that, oh, I've got that out of my system. What do you do next? Oh, I didn't see that question. Thank you. Yeah. So what you do next is if they, especially if they ask you, uh, so what do you think about the solar farm proposal? I mean, that makes it easy. They don't, people won't always ask at that point. Sometimes they'll just be quiet. But at that point, you could also say, hey, are you interested in hearing my, my views on this? Uh, and uh, that gives them the chance as well to check in with themselves. Okay, am I receptive? Am, do I actually want to want to receive what's going on for this other person? Or do I want to tell them more about why, about my own views before, before listening? So that's what I what I often do is just just check and make sure that someone is ready and keen to hear before before speaking. Okay, so let's move on to effective reciprocity receptivity. Uh, I really, yeah, I mentioned this author before. Beausoleil draws from advances in neuroscience to demonstrate that receptivity is often a subconscious phenomenon and so careful consideration of physical dimensions of dialogue is really important in the context of public deliberation. So for example, if you want to create a sense of effective re receptivity in yourself as you're listening to someone who you disagree with, something like a breathing exercise uh, as employed by the US military to reduce stress and increase cognitive performance has been demonstrated to help uh, help increase cognitive performance. Another thing uh, that, that Bosole actually mentions is what she refers to as immediate abstraction. And I think this term is maybe slightly misleading but it involves consciously focusing on one's physical response rather than on the cognitive processes, rather than your cognitive processes prior to speaking. So for example, actually, I think I might give an example next. Uh, yes, so examples, applications, how, what does this actually look like in real life? So she suggests a few ways that effective receptive activity in structured social dialogue might look. So as the one designing or structuring social dialogue, she suggests beginning with activities that foster awareness of one's own body and affect before conversing with others. So that might be a grounding exercise where you close your eyes, uh, put your feet flat on the floor, notice whatever sensations come up in the body, uh, are there any feelings in the body? That kind of exercise. Uh, another way to do it, uh, to engage effective recep receptivity is to slow down the pace, to allow others time to sync up or tune into sensory clues. Uh, and the third is more common in structured social dialogue. But this point about demarcating a contained space so that there's some predictability uh, also encourages safety. So this might look like uh, asking people not to leave or come into the room uh, in whatever 30 minute, during whatever 30 minute discussion or outlining a really clear agenda so that people know, okay, they'll have time to go out to the loo in 20 minutes, uh, which might encourage them to, to sit in that contained predictable space. How might we engage effective receptivity in everyday talk? Uh, this might mean, for example, taking I said 10, that might be a little too many, but it depends on what kind of comments you have coming up at the dinner table. Uh, or as mentioned before, that, that point around uh, immediate abstract, abstraction. So noticing the physical response in the body prior to responding. 
uh, to what someone says. So do we have, it might not be worth demonstrating this because it's harder to demonstrate. Uh, okay, let's demonstrate it like this. I'm going to ask Beck to say a few more things about how much she is horrified by the energy transition. And I want everyone in the group just to notice, to, to do one of those two strategies that I mentioned before. So either just notice what's happening in your physical body after what she, after you hear what she says, or uh, take a couple really long, deep breaths and notice what happens in your body. Does that work for you, Beck? <laughs> I'm trying to think of something I can say that's going to elicit a physical response. My goodness, it's pressure, but of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to put any pressure on you. I can say something as well. <laughs> do you want me to do it now? Are you ready for it now? That'd be great. Unless anyone has any questions about what I've asked you to do. Is that clear? So two options, notice what's going on in your body or take some deep breaths and then notice what's going on in your body. <laughs> well, I think the thing about the energy transition that just really bothers me is it's all these communists from the city with their made up bullshit of climate change. They don't really care about us. They're just trying to get more money for themselves. They're greedy, they're liars, they're terrible people. Oh, you're reminding me of my neighbor back in Melbourne. Oh. <laughs> ah, yeah. I, I've, I've felt that one. Does anyone want to share how it was to notice what was going on in your body? Sure. Some free therapy, squiggly feeling in the stomach. <laughs> you felt a gurgling in your stomach? <laughs> yeah, often that kind of, you know, I think when somebody's saying something very oppositional, that's, yeah, I feel it in that spot. Yeah. yeah. I've just been listening to a podcast on neuroscience and everything that you're reflecting on is, is actually very well matched to the research in our, um, you know, physical in the physical sense and all the the neuro circuits so yeah i think you're making a really good uh, you know progress in, in linking that all those well-established uh, results that we know in, in neuroscience and applying it to a more um big picture context and how that impacts social relationships and energy transition so that's yeah. i think in that case it's just engaging that fight or flight response absolutely yeah and, and noticing that that flight or fight response has arisen. And once we notice and observe it, then it relaxes a little bit. Someone else said it felt like my heart was starting to beat faster, chest felt tight, breathing became a little shallow. So yeah, everyone's noticing these really embodied responses. And in order to create that receptivity, and sometimes also in order to to employ these ideas around cognitive receptivity, it can be really helpful to first do that physical uh, check-in or physical effective receptivity uh, prior to moving into the cognitive, depending on how much it's affected you. So for the sake of time, we'll continue. Won't we'll get any more into the neuroscience of it or, uh, too deep. Okay, so what are the possible challenges with this there? Uh, I see incredible and quite exciting opportunities for changing social dialogue and change and uh, in, in a way that can be quite, quite easy uh, and increasing or improving uh, the capabilities for democratic uh, or social dialogue, um, but what are the challenges as well? 
So there is the question of to what is it extent, is it appropriate to extend therapeutic techniques to employ in social dialogue and community engagement? And essentially this is, this, this might fall in under the logical fallacy of a slippery slope argument, because the point that I'm making is not that any therapeutic technique is, is relevant to dem democratic conversations, but specifically uh, these two ideas around how to create receptivity within yourself uh, might, be, might be relevant. But again, it's, it's a question. Uh, and and possibly a reason to understand why these techniques haven't been explored more, especially non-directive reflective listening, because as I mentioned in the second point, um, Carl Rogers in 1961 wrote about this. Uh, he, in his, in his book, uh, which is, I think this it was on becoming a person. He uses a political example when suggesting to, to explain how difficult these techniques are to apply. So he says, could you offer a non-directive reflective uh, listening to a Russian communist? How about Senator Joe McCarthy? Also, do you want to? Do you? because there's there's so much fear in that in offering receptivity to someone that you so profoundly disagree with so is this something that that we might get any buy-in on is it practical does it make sense ah uh, as a way to do individual capacity building on social dialogue and the third challenge that I'm identifying is, is this an incredibly slow way to influence a socio-technical system? Because I feel some, some urgency around, I feel a lot of urgency around this question and I care really, really deeply around this question. So, closing, uh, hopefully in time for some questions. I mentioned that the COP26 Just Transition Statement says, suggests that uh, support of social dialogue may include strengthening social dialogue through capacity building of the participants. I was really excited about, about this and how much this aligns with my own thinking around, around the importance of social dialogue and uh, capacity building potential. Uh, I also say that catalyzing social dialogue through encouraging receptivity, both cognitive and effective receptivity, might allow more flow and movement in the socio-technical system. Uh, I'm asking, is it possible to build capacity in cognitive and effective receptivity? receptivity? Uh, and I think it is possible to test the above hypothesis that, it, that encouraging receptivity allows more, more flow in social dialogue and then in the socio-technical system, although that is a harder uh, hypothesis to test. Uh, and I think there's ample scope, just to close, for further theoretical and empirical work exploring the social dynamics of an energy transition around identity, culture, uh, both collective and individual identities, how this relates to social dialogue, and then around the question of how to catalyze more constructive dialogue. Uh, and also uh, curious to what extent this may apply to other issues, other public issues. So I've listed my work cited, if anyone wants to see that. And I'll stop sharing so that we can close with some questions. I well, thanks uh, everyone for watching this uh, video if you're watching online and um, stay tuned for more uh, seminars in the read series. Thank you.